And hello, everybody. Welcome to Narrative Live. It's good to be with you. I'm Zev Shalev. Eric Garland is with us again. How are you, Eric? To quote Keith Richards, it's great to be here. It's great to be anywhere. It's also great to be seven days away from what I think is going to be a momentous, momentous election. I really am expecting a tremendous amount of votes for the Democrats. I just, I know I'm, everyone's t talking about the exact opposite, about this red tide and about this red wave. I just don't see that happening. I think that in seven days from now, we are going to have a watershed moment in American history where we really are going to see the Democrats, uh, I would call it a landslide. A landslide might be a little excessive for what may they may achieve, but I think they will win the Senate and the House. And I think there'll be all sorts of surprises in various state houses where, you know, some polls are showing that some state houses are going to flip to Democrats. And then of course, the big governor's races and some other races are going to go Democrat too. So I'm feeling pretty bullish about the next seven days. It all is up to Americans to actually just go out and do the voting that they need to do. This always reminds me of South Africa's election in 27th of April, 1994 is the day that South Africa had its first fully democratic elections and people showed up mm. in their millions lined up, um, wow. there's these long lineups of white, black, every kind of race you can imagine, all lining up peacefully around the country, deciding on a new future, deciding to move themselves into a new dynamic. And I think that's what this election is about. I think this is going to be the election that the GOP gets counted out. And if they do get counted out, it means that the rest of us is able to actually forge a new America that is going to be far more equitable and far more about what the founders of this country promised than ever before. So that's my hope for next Tuesday. It's I'm putting all my energy into that. And I hope everyone votes away as we try to save democracy. And I think we have a good shot of it. It's really special that you can share that with our American audience here, that this is a precious thing to be able to have your vote counted, your voice heard. And I mean, I think the Australians have had the best deal with democracy sausages. If you vote, you get free sausage, which is, <laughs> and they have like a department of democracy. I'm not making this up. It would be a it's good great. joke, but they really do this. And I'm like, those are civilized people. It's like, how do we get them to vote? Make it illegal not to vote. And if you go vote, you get sausages. But in other places, people stayed in prison 20, 30 years. <laughs> they were willing to be subject to all kinds of violence and indignity. And uh, you got to watch it go over to that first vote in the new South Africa. Yeah, and it was really a remarkable moment in time. It's, it's truly historic, obviously. And to just be working at a local radio station, there's one of my first jobs at, in journalism. I was like just loving every minute of it, obviously. But mm -hmm. that morning we were nervous. There was a little bit of nervousness in the air. You know, the choppers who do the traffic reports for our local radio station were the first sign that things were going to go well, because then they were up in the air and going to all the polling booths and the polling stations saying, no, this looks peaceful. It actually looks fine. People are getting along just fine, standing in line, having a democratic process, getting to see each other. And quite joyously so, as we know, it landed up being the election that elected Nelson Mandela, the president of South Africa, a very different new South Africa with the whole course of South Africa changed. And I think next, next Tuesday is really that kind of day. You could really see that happen. Now you met Nelson Mandela, didn't you? Yeah, I met him a couple of times. When I say meet, I am so in awe of the guy that I didn't actually, as a, just a very young junior producer, I was there and I said, hello, but I did not interact in a meaningful way. But I'll tell you, there's a beautiful story where he came to this radio station, Radio 702, where I was working late at night for a talk show that I was producing to answer calls and it was a really big deal. Mandela was coming around during the election campaign. And so he comes in there and the executives of the radio station had laid out this very nice table of food and all sorts of stuff as they would for any VIP guest. You know, he arrives, he's gracious to everybody. He's, his soul enters a room like well before he does. You just feel him in the space and it just, and then he comes in and he's just this smile beaming out of him. You know, after that kind of years of wow. imprisonment, just to have that kind of but he also had this beauty where he didn't talk to all the executives. I mean, he did say hi to all the executives, but the person that he actually landed up sitting next to was the, the station cleaner who had been there cleaning the studios every night. And he sat huh. down with her and he had a piece of cake with her. And um, <laughs> it was one of those moments where he thought, oh, this is just a very precious, precious human being who is single-handedly wow. changed a country, you know, and it was single-handedly. It was something he did just on his own. The night before, by the way, I should tell you, there was like, it was tense as anything. Like it was nothing was felt like it, it was going to hold together. I was on the phone with Nelson Mandela's people demanding we get the first interview with him, which we did the next morning on a broken telephone. And, uh, 
Uh, and also interviewing Mungo Wait, you, you get the first interview with yes. Nelson Mandela? Yes, I'm, one of my greatest bookings ever was to get the first interview with Nelson Mandela. And it was because I went to his spokesperson and I said, this is after the elections. So it's after Cassidy's vote, I got the first interview. I did this because they were going to give it to the government broadcasters, the SABC. And I literally blew up at Carl Niehaus, who was then his spokesperson uh, the night before. And I said, Carl, after everything, because I'd worked at this radio station that was pretty democratic leaning and independent and was right there all the way through the entire thing. And I was like, after everything we've done to you, for you, you're going to let these government broadcasters have you first. And he reneged. He's actually said, yeah, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give it to you. So it landed up being a very broken phone conversation of a cell phone and Nelson Mandela was hard of hearing, but it was an interview. So it got on the air and I got to say, congratulations, Madiba, probably amongst mm. the first people in, in South Africa to be able to do that on that day. So uh, wow. that, that was a good day. It was a good day. And I think next week, I mean, if people embody this idea that this is a change election, this is not just an election about the inflation or abortion, all those things are super important, but it's also the future of America. And this is really what we're voting about. We're voting about, is it going to be a democracy? Is it going to be a, a whatever version of autocracy the GOP want to enforce? We are moving in one of those directions and we're going to decide, I think, next Tuesday, which direction we're going to move into. So um, it should be that every single person who can vote does vote, and hopefully they do, because it's uh, the vote of our lives. Well, another major facet of this election is it comes on the heels of one that we're still investigating that was so beset by violence and controversy, and that was a subject of a massive malign conspiracy. And we're doing it again. And the question is, what's different? The U.S. attorney's offices have been naming their election officers. Now, this is the U.S. attorney. So there's the, the feds, the DOJ, because yeah. those guys are tireless these days. They are announcing the points of contact are for anything that, that smacks of criminality, fraud. We're on it. So if you're worried that your vote is somehow going to be tampered with, there are more eyes on how this is all working than there has ever been. And on top of that, the turnout is extremely high. This is not a typical midterm election. It's almost assured that when one party takes over the White House, that there's a backlash. It's a very common trope and pattern. And that is, it's certainly the numbers in some of the elections that we're seeing in some of the poll data, like Sherry Beasley versus Ted Budd in North Carolina. I just saw that's down to a one point race Interesting there. And uh, you know, 25 million people have cast their votes. Most of those people are Democrats already. Now, they're not the younger demographic, apparently. They're still the younger demographic is probably going to show up on that day, which is actually quite good because it means that there is going to be a buildup into that day as well. But the fact that 25 million people have already voted, that's a lot of votes. And mostly Democrats, mostly people motivated by saving democracy and by abortion. Those are the things that they're voting for. It's, you know, I've been listening to the closing arguments by Obama and Biden, and I, that's the theme. The theme is democracy matters. Who you represent matters. And in this case, I think will change your life. So just voting party loyal is so silly on these kinds of days. You've really got to think about who your candidate is, whether they really represent you and whether you can abide by their party. I think more importantly, the character of the candidates is a big issue for me as well, of course. Um, I'm in Missouri and I've got two solid weeks where I can vote at a number of locations. We still have Jay Ashcroft, who is the son of John Ashcroft who is secretary of state here. And there's some questions oh. about voting in 2020. Um, but we've got, uh, you know, a Republican supermajority here in Missouri. And despite all that, I've got more access to vote now than I did two years ago. And a lot of people don't think of the implications of having voting on a single day and having long lines. Cause if you have people that have to take the bus to work, they don't own an automobile and they have hourly wage jobs where the managers may not be very sympathetic to them wanting to exercise their democratic rights. Here, having voting on a single day takes out a huge chunk of those people who deserve representation. Opening it up to several days and giving people breathing room so that it's like, well, I don't have to work on Wednesday. I, I can take the bus from here to there and make it back. And I don't have to, you know, I get there. Oh my God, there's a four hour line. I'm going to get fired. I can't get fired. 
I mean, there's a whole lot of people that have the right to vote, but that will have to pay a much higher cost than others who are more fortunate. Yeah. Two things that just to pick up on what you just said there. Last time round in the 2020 elections, we had what we called a red mirage, where on voting day, it looked like the Republicans were, were going to win everything. And that's the basis on which Trump ended up opposing the Biden victory. But in reality, a lot of the early voting or mail-in voting was then going to be counted afterwards. And that was going to bring up a lot of the Democratic ballots from Democratic regions. And that was going to balance out the vote. This time it's going to be different because I think a lot of the early voting is already being counted. So I think in some ways we might have a democratic surge right at the beginning and it may just stay all the way through the end. I don't know exactly how each precinct or each district is counting the votes in which order, but I think it's going to look a little different than it did in past years. Although it certainly could take weeks for us to get the final result. You know, the other thing that I, I comes to mind is that because there is so many people that are voting this year early and a lot of the surge in the in number of registrations means we don't really, we can't really rely on polling. So no matter where you are, if the race is even remotely close, you got to vote. If you just have to vote because you don't know. I mean, they're talking about even a red surge in parts of New York State. Which I'm like, who would have thought that would have happened? But it might happen. So no, no matter where you are, it used to be that it came down to just these few swing states, and it probably will come down to just a few swing states. But every single vote counts this time because there is an unpredictability with a number of new voters that are showing up at the polls and new registered voters especially with so many big issues at play you just got to believe that every vote must count and that means everyone needs to go out and vote so if you haven't made a plan yet do it and then also dreaming the possibility of what it might be how amazing would it be to have a house and a senate and a presidency that could fulfill some of the biden agenda which is smart and it does Broad. the job and actually takes care of the people of America and looks to the future and competes with China and does all these things that you want an agenda to do and how great it would be for just a little bit of time for America to actually pull the stuff together, get us back on track and then proceed with the future, which will be quite phenomenal if we can do all those things, whether it's semiconductors or AI or all the other incredible things that freedom can help us develop, that can only happen if we are get this agenda through. And, you know, you don't want the GOP shutting down the government in the first week or starting investigations about nonsense like they did with Clinton. I mean, this is not what we need right now. We need a really big, decisive victory that says to the world and says to all of America, this is who we are, this is who we're going to be, and this is how we're going to march forward into the future. Well, I mean, we are making strategic moves as a nation because of the Biden administration that have been 50 years in coming, including disengaging with China, not deepening our commercial and industrial ties with them. In fact, shutting them down and drastically changing the world supply chain. That's huge. Yeah. We've been doing the other thing for over 30 years and there were good reasons th theoretically to do it, even though we probably should have read America versus America by Wang Huning, who's, the, <laughs> you know, who's like, here's how we destroy America. And that guy's- It was just there out. in black and white. I didn't realize it's it was so written there. <laughs> yeah, we need to take their farmland in the Midwest. And then, oh, you know- okay. You know, That's their plan. <laughs> yeah. And oh, you know, make sure that when you manufacture stuff for them, that doesn't work because they really rely on technology and they don't have traditions that we do that go back a long way. So if their stuff breaks, they're going to cry all the time. So maybe the decision to engage was a little optimistic on our part uh well that's done but and, you know yeah. ooh, it has that's it hasn't strategic. worked for them that they seem to be in a lot of trouble they are going to try build this alliance with russia and march on into the separate universe that they're in but the rest of the world is not coming along with them as far as i can tell well maybe Bibi netanyahu will but um it just certainly seems to me like the biden administration has done what they've needed to do to get us to a point where we can reestablish america's leadership in the world but then beyond that now is the chance for the American electorate to actually choose to be united under one agenda that actually takes us forward. There's no point in this combat politics that we've been doing that has been inspired by foreign forces. These are things that China and Russia and all these other states with these skills in propaganda and skills in creating division and polarization. It's not because we genuinely hate each other. I just don't believe that. I think that we just have to get rid of the party that sold out and march forward to the party that has a plan. And then beyond that, we need to rebuild a, a strong conservative party or conservative movement in this country that is like the old uh, GOP was, because that really is where most of Americans are living. And, and most of them aren't driven by politics, but by their needs mm. and economic issues. And when we're going to rip out 
the supply chain from China and we're going to start making semiconductors in Southern Ohio. Um, yeah. You know, I forget what the calculation of investments is going to be, but it's in the gazillions. 50, I mean, yeah, that's 50 billion or something. It's a lot. And then a hundred million was just one plant in New York last week. And the interesting thing is we're also going to, that's going to create another competition in all the other stuff you need to make semiconductors in. Competition? Yeah. Something we're not, you're not used to. Uh, we had, well, so Zev, do you know what Route 66 is? I do. Of course I know what Route 66 is. Yeah. All right. So, you know, you know, this is the Nat King Cole song. Yes. If you have a plan to travel west and it goes down the cities, I've, it goes from St. Louis, Joplin, Missouri, and Oklahoma City. I've driven from from St. Louis to Oklahoma City on every chunk of the old 66 that is left. And the Eisenhower Highway system overtook that after the war. But when you go down 66, the real 66, and you have to like get onto it and then you have to get off because like it, somebody built a house in front right. of it. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's wild. Parts of this country, in the middle of the country, these humble parts of Missouri and Kansas and Oklahoma, these little towns that kind of fallen into disrepair, but they were part of an industrial landscape, an industrial ecosystem where parts for the railways or for the automobile industry, they were all over. And so these towns that they're, they're forgotten and then flooded with drugs and, you know, despair, you have people living there. The reason for that town's existence has appeared and no one really explained it to the residents and that's nice. not their fault right nice. you know i was from a town that was never very pretty but it had been at better times before yeah. and we started ripping out entire industries and putting them in other countries it's not just we think oh well detroit sucks now and it's a mess which is true but it's not just the detroits it's the the little towns where you just you, you put an industry there and employs 80, 180, 280 people. And that's a reason for that town to exist. There's yeah. prosperity. You have a school you can go to. It's small enough. You know what you're doing. When they talk about the real America and that small town life, it's not about Republican or Democrat. That's about cohesive. And there's a reason to be there. And there's some pride in what you create there and what you build there. We went that's away from neither, that. Yeah, it's not a Democratic or Republican. It's just the American dream. And... The American dream is still out there. It's still very viable. Now is the chance to recapture that. You know, it's true that during these last few years, their, you know, Chinese monopoly on all this production has meant a lot of jobs has moved over there. But that's going to come back now. We can build that. There's nothing that says we can't do any of the things that they do in China in the United States. It's all perfectly okay for us to do it in the United States and we should be doing it. We have people who are smart and capable and we have new technologies that are going to make it more efficient, easy to do. And why not? Let's talk a little bit about what's in the news because we're going to, we've just spoken for 30 minutes about just our opening dreams and ambitions for uh, next week, which is great. And uh, Pelosi, I'm gonna, I said Pelosi who done it because I am going to just go out on a limb here and say, okay, there was a guy who attacked the speaker's husband. Yes. For political motives. Yes. But it feels to me like maybe someone behind the scenes is prodding all this because it does certainly benefit one party or the other, or certainly one party, and then also elements within the other party. But when I looked at the Republican immediate conspiracy theory that popped up through Elon Musk's account on Twitter, I was like, wait a second, they've already got a conspiracy theory about him having a lover and all this other stuff, which is completely untrue, of course, but they had already concocted this within seconds of the news breaking. It's got suspicious for me. I don't know who's responsible for it. And I mean, we know that the guy is, uh, is the, the pap, uh, also Canadian, by the way. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't think that he's just him. I just feel like there's, it's the timing of these kinds of things don't just happen so close to an election, so conveniently close to an election where Pelosi is such a target as she is this week of the GOP. Normally, you know, if they're going to happen at, in this kind of staging, it's going to happen probably through a coordinated method. That's just my opinion. I don't know. I've got a couple of facts that'll color that. Okay. So first <laughs> of all, the DePap construction as a name is very, very unusual. It's neither French nor Italian. So that's interesting. I guess the suspect took it from his stepfather, which is an unusual matter, but he was down in the United States here only in a relationship with a woman named Olesya Taub, who is a Russian born nudity activist. Ah, yes. So there are some details here. Interesting. That are not very typical, even for crazy people who want to 
hurt others. Uh, yeah. It's like, huh, okay, so you're from Canada, sort of, but that it's not your original birth, and you're here with your Russian nudity activist girlfriend. And you're attacking the speaker's husband because you care about these policies, but you're, it's just weird. Um, so that's the Pelosi story. I don't have very much else to say about it, except that we hope he gets better. And the family has now heard the 911 tapes. They know what, as much as possible was about what went down there. So uh, let's hope he recovers quickly. What should we go to next? I, Mr. Lindsey Graham is going to have to testify. In the Georgia so they inquiry, let, uh, apparently they didn't. Uh, so the midnight back door, side door move by um, Clarence Thomas apparently didn't stick. It didn't it stick. On it didn't the, stick. The upside down shadow docket yeah, that no, it he didn't. issued a, a papal <laughs> fiat from. It's like, okay, that's interesting. Well, no, Lindsay's no. on. <laughs> Lindsay's going to have to testify because, you know, you do have to actually respond to these things if you're a U.S. senator or any other citizen of the country. When the, the court, court tells you to come and talk to them, you go yeah, and talk this, to them. This whole, uh, uh, you fuck off, you know, you're, you're, you're just Congress. You're just a court. That, yeah. that is not how it works for regular people. You end up in the backseat of a sheriff's car with handcuffs on when a judge crooks their little finger. That's yeah. how it works for everyone else. So what's this whole, well, I'm going to have... <laughs> I'm going to have the Supreme Court justice whose wife was part of trying to overthrow this very state selection. He's going to sneak in the side door and say that abracadabra, that, I don't it, have to do it. I, it's ridiculous. It's rid ridiculous. And I don't know what the GOP gets off doing this. He's an attorney. This. Sorry, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't popped yeah, off or right. ranted in, in a while. He's a judge advocate general. He's a colonel in the Air Force. He's an attorney his whole life. And he's like, ah, pish posh, your, your grand jury subpoena. And the court was like, this is completely unreasonable, this argument, <laughs> and threw it out very quickly, as they should have, because it is completely unreasonable. Um, now, here's uh, Twitter, over at Twitter, which is now, I don't know, China-owned, Saudi-owned, both-owned. Elon Musk is doing Elon some crazy Binance stuff. put up some money. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it wasn't festive until you have the Chinese cryptocurrency run out of Malta. Yeah, now yeah, we're that. talking some legitimacy. Yeah, to have that. So they apparently took down a China-based network that was operating within Twitter, there were two right-wing networks and one left-wing network, interestingly enough, that the Chinese Dear God, what is MAGA porn? Do I want to know? Uh, ma MAGA, maybe it's MAGA comma porn? I don't know. Nope, the, there's no comma in there. Uh, just I don't want to porn. know anymore. Hate for Trump, China based anyhow. But there you go. Um, it's, apparently, he's trying to look like he's decent. But on the other hand, he's taken down all the, uh, or withdrawn all the permissions for the people who used to do the moderations on Twitter. So all the content moderation that we used to get on Twitter, the people who did that can't access the tools to do that anymore. So there's no moderation a week into the elections. You never know what's going to happen. He's fired the board. He's fired the executive team. He's proposing an $8 fee for every blue check that they issue, which is the verification thing that they use. It's a fun place to be, Twitter. Every time I go on, every time I go on Twitter, it's like 100 uh, followers less. I don't know where they've gone. I mean, maybe they're trolls. Maybe they're bots. You want to talk about what a brilliant influence op this was? Um, we're in the middle of this really important election and the people that have blue checks, their rules for these blue checks is not just you verify that you're who you are. It's like you have to have some form of public figure status. So we know that it's you and nobody's stolen your very important account. Yeah. Now, Zeb, do you have a blue check? No, I never got one. I was, I never considered a legitimate I still person. cherish you. Thank you for, um, thank you for cherishing me. And I envy you, yours. I envy your blue check. Every time I look at your account, don't, I'm like, don't, oh, I wish I had one. Don't. You know, it's not that actually I'd never, I never do that, but it's annoying not to have one when you should have one. And for political reasons or whatever, they've excluded a bunch of us and the thresholds to get them are so ridiculous. But so the, so the people that have them work for major journalistic outlets or have been commented on in those outlets, I don't know, but the media is a very self-regarding crew. And so if you want people who would normally be making comments and doing content about the abortion laws that are endangering women's health care or um, anything really about the election. And you stop with this, hey, we'll let anyone in for eight bucks. And all these self-important people stop everything and go, oh, let's talk about me. Yeah. No, let's talk about the election. Yeah, let's we got talk a week. About That's a good point you're making there, that this was a distraction tool, but also... I am a little worried about there being no moderation tools available to the moderators there for the next week as we're heading into an election, because 
as we know, you can really tweak an election by dropping in a couple of stories here and there and amplifying them, as Elon Musk showed us on the weekend, or as Fox News shows us on a regular basis. It's not hard to imagine a world where China or Saudi Arabia wanting to lean in on behalf of the GOP, start pushing narratives and making stories trend and all sorts of things happen uh, in this week leading up to the elections. All right. So do you know who runs like the top three television channels in France? It's the government. The state of France. Yeah. Yeah. And BBC, who runs the Beeb? The it's British people about. do, but the British government uh, points everybody. Yeah. British people. Yeah. Yeah. They and, pay a license you know, fee for that. All right. So in other words, like China will not let the United Arab Emirates run its platforms. No. They no. don't. They wouldn't let America run its platforms. Never mind. <laughs> the, Chinese, yeah. the Chinese, like you and I could put together the world's biggest hedge fund yeah. and Beijing ain't going to sell us their, you know, WeChat. <laughs> How are they? No. I would love to. it. No, I mean, it's, <laughs> Can I, don't I please understand. sit on the API where all of your citizens are talking? I'm sure I would not construct an enormous intelligence operation personally out of that. Yeah. I'm sure you wouldn't. I trust you. I trust you, Eric. I Please go, you know, help you have, have out of take the entire system. Go for it. Um, it's well, what uh, are we doing here? I don't understand why they allow a Chinese asset to buy the biggest social media platform in politics. I don't understand why he's now implementing all these changes on a whim. Like you can just like, okay, I'm just going to do all this by myself now. And we all know it's the Chinese and Saudi Arabia. And the more we say that, I bet you like the less, <laughs> the shorter our lifespan is on Twitter right now. And I, it's infuriating to me that something that is important as a social network that is the battleground for politics these days is being taken over. This was the last vestige of free speech that we had in America. I'm sure we'll find our way out of this because I trust the people in charge, but it's disappointing. I would have wanted Twitter to go in a completely different direction. And, we know, just had congressional hearings about how many spies were in yeah, Twitter. Yeah, Chinese and spies, like, Saudi spies, yeah. spies. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. We, how come we didn't have a full discussion on that? Um, it's I don't even understand. It, it wasn't meant to happen. It was like two weeks ago. It was like, oh, the deal's not going to happen. It's fallen through. And then suddenly you turn around and what? It's like, it is happening. Oh, well, now he owns it. I'm sure the people there are desperate because it can't be a fun place to work right now. He's doing a witch hunt for who supports him and who doesn't support him. It's not necessarily a positive vibe over there, but it's still a good place to work. And I'm sure a lot of people are trying to figure out how they're going to survive the Elon years there. So Every minute of Narratives reporting, every story that we break is made possible by our patrons. You too can become a patron by joining at patreon.com forward slash Narrative. Narrative. Where truth lives. One day, you'll tell the story of autocrats, crooks, and kings who came for our freedom. A story of citizens who stood up to tyranny and won. The people prevailed and renewed an old vow to a more perfect union. And that was just the beginning. The story continues. Narrative, where truth lives.